we're back, everybody. Um, hopefully you can see me and find me again on Facebook. Um, that's never happened before. We just totally went off the air in the middle of Zoom and it was like a flash of light and there goes Zoom and there goes Facebook. So hopefully it wasn't anything that I said. <laughs> Who knows nowadays, right? But we're back. Um, so uh, please join me on this feed. I'm also going to go back to the other feed and look at your questions because I know a lot of you had questions there. Um, but like I said, oh my gosh, 59 comments. This is fantastic. So I am going back to your questions and going to answer. Okay. So let's see where we were. So many good questions. Thanks for the highs. Hi, Elaine, Megan, Victoria, Kristen, Dr. Joe Ellen. Um, so she asked, what is the best source of vitamin D in the most efficient form for the body to metabolize? So a good clean form that's soy free and other, you know, excipient free, they're all pretty, pretty good. Um, you can look on our Dr. Jill Health um, website to see some of the brands that we carry. I like Thorn Research, Orthomolecular Products, Zymogen, Designs for Health, uh, many others, Quicksilver, I'm sure I'll forget to mention a few. Um, there are liposomal forms, so the liquid forms, if you're having trouble with a capsule, you can try a liquid drop. And some of them have K2 uh, with them, which is great for bone health and metabolism. So so that can be a good thing too, to get them together. The only thing with the K2 form is if you want to go higher in your dose for a day or two, you can get too much K2 because they're together. So it's probably better to have them separately if you're you know, doing various doses of vitamin D3. Um, so we got through, hi, Cynthia, hi, Lisa, hi, Selene. Hopefully some of you are back on listening. Um, could ever, Lisa asked, could, ever, could one ever be clear of psoriasis? Yes, Lisa, guess what? Um, I don't know, a decade ago, I had psoriasis really bad on my scalp and back of my neck. And um, this is not the case for all patients, but for me, um, I had two root canals on both sides here and they were the second to last molar. I think number 19 on one side and number two on the other. I don't know the numbers of the teeth very well. So if you're a dentist, you can correct me. But what happened was those root canals, because I had a weak immune system from my mold related illness and Lyme disease, um, I was getting little bits of bacteria into my immune or into my bloodstream and unbeknownst to me, that was affecting my autoimmune psoriasis. When I pulled those two teeth uh, and got rid of the root canals, my psoriasis went away within seven days. So again, not for everybody, but if you do have root canals, I would consider that as an issue. Looking at the gut, leaky gut can contribute. So if you have yeast or fungal or um, mold exposure or bacterial overgrowth, those can all be contributors to psoriasis. Um, as can other tick-borne infections like Bartonella or Lyme disease. So Lane, do you recommend a second GPL test after detoxing and does it show improvement? So she's talking about um, probably the mycotoxin test and she's probably heard me say, usually I test in the beginning and then I don't always retest because what you're doing when you're looking at mycotoxins in the urine is you're looking at, at excretion. So when we are excreting those mycotoxins in the urine and then we're doing a detox, we want that excretion to occur. So if we test too soon afterwards, um, sometimes we'll get higher levels and it'll be confusing for the practitioner and patient. If you know that you might be higher levels because you're excreting and that's a good thing, there's no problem retesting. But I usually wait at least six months to retest and sometimes longer because what I usually do is I'm looking at their symptoms and seeing if they're improving over time. Kristen, uh, those that are immune compromised scheduled to get the vaccine phase two in the spring, do you recommend we get it? Um, or is ivermectin supporting your immune system safer? So as you can imagine, I have to be very careful about how I talk about this. Um, as the data comes out, I promise you, I will keep you posted because I definitely have thoughts and feelings very strong ones on certain issues. But what I will tell you now is this, so far, most of the trials have been about two months. And if you were to get a reaction like autoimmunity from a vaccine, that's not going to happen in a short amount of time. Now, I'm not saying they cause that, we don't know. But I would, if it were me, I would not be the first one in line because I wanna see more data on the safety. I'm not saying they're not safe. I'm not saying we might not find in time, it's no problem with autoimmunity. But I am saying, I don't think that right now, um, I would feel safe with the amount of time that we've seen them um, getting that I'd like to watch a little bit longer. And I hope that makes sense. Um, 
best binder, Megan, for ochratoxin and citrin. Um, ochratoxin tends to be bound very well by cholestyramine, which is that prescription. Um, some people call it fish powder because it tastes so bad and smells bad, um, but it's very effective. Um, I still like to use clay and charcoal and zeolite and citrus pectin and glycomannins and chlorella. Um, so you can use all of those, um, but for um, ochratoxin, the um, cholestyramine still tends to be excellent. Nicole's asking, is that like Zyfaxin? Yes, when I was at, at talking about treating the different infections, Rifaximin is a generic name for Zyfaxin. So yes, Nicole. Um, and then Sassy says, I don't bind, I use sunlight. It's probably from cute dog. Yeah, Ravi is a darling uh, companion. Elizabeth asked, what if you have COMT and don't tolerate quercetin and bromelain? Um, yes, Elizabeth, I understand I'm similar to you. I have a funny story to tell. Um, I what was it the other day I had a reaction and I thought, oh, quercetin will help. Um, and I can't remember what it was that I was thinking I had an allergic reaction and I thought, oh, I'll take some quercetin. I don't normally take a lot because like you, Elizabeth, I have COMT plus plus, which means we don't break down norepinephrine, epinephrine um, and estrogens as well uh, because that's a, a rapid metabolizer pathway. I'm sorry, the slow pathway, slow pathway. We get accumulation of those things in our system and quercetin blocks that pathway. So all that to say back on my funny story, I'm driving home and I'm like, oh my gosh, like I'm not normally a nervous, anxious person, but that particular day, you know, the feeling when you've just gotten to a car accident or you just got stopped by the police and you're just like, ah, life, you know, you're feeling really like revved up inside and it's all adrenaline. That's what happens. You get this adrenaline surge. Like if you hit, if you have a fender bender and you just ran into someone and you got this adrenaline surge and you just feel like you're about to explode inside because you have all that adrenaline. I was driving home from work that day after taking like six quercetin, which I should know better. And I was like, what in the world? My body feels like so revved up. And so like, like I wasn't anxious mentally, but internally it felt like that. I was like, oh, I just did an experiment in inhib inhibition of COMT. And for me, I already have a slow COMT. And so by taking that large dose of quercetin, I just upregulated my adrenaline and I got this like massive surge and it was pretty awful. Um, so it didn't take long, took some charcoal. I was fine, but I learned better than to take six quercetin for COMT plus plus mutations. Um, Ali asked, how long does it take mold related weight gain to shed? Oh my dear. I'm so sorry to hear that. I remember having like ankles that look like elephants. I couldn't wear dresses. I mean, three plus pitting edema with the mold. I definitely had lots of water retention and weight gain. Um, the difficulty there is you really can't lose the weight until you detoxify because dilution is the solution to pollution. And what that means is our bodies like to hang on to the uh, weight and the fat because it dilutes the toxic effect. So not that you can't start to lose weight during that process, but you really need to focus first on the detox. And I would say that could take anywhere from six to 18 months. And then after you're adequately detoxified, that's when you might be able to start losing that weight. And it's no fun process. I'm so sorry that you're going through that. Um, Nicole says, my question is, if someone suspects chronic Lyme, what's the best, oh, we talked about that last time, um, mold, but can't leave the environment, what are ways they can help protect? So Patricia asked about, um, what about if you have mold in your environment, but you can't leave and what do you, what can you do? So this is tricky because I always say it's like bailing out a boat that's leaking and you're getting just a little bit of traction, but you're like two steps forward and one step back. But I understand some people are in a moldy environment. Some people have exposures. Some people just can't do anything. So it's still worth it to take binders. I still most every day, I mean, I'm in a clean condo. My workplace is clean. There's no mold exposure, but mold is everywhere. So when I travel, um, which we don't aren't doing much anymore, of course, uh, when I used to travel, I used to take charcoal every day. Um, and if you're in a moldy environment, I would absolutely take binders. I would start the detox process and I would open your windows again, dilution, solution, pollution. So what you can do is you can dilute the air in your home by getting high quality air filters, uh, changing out the um, filtration on your HVAC system with a high quality MERV rating filter, getting Austin air units, like I mentioned, um, opening the windows whenever possible. Cause anytime you can dilute that effect, it will make you feel a ton better, even in a toxic environment. Okay, mast cell and extremely sensitive. This is Taylor, smells, fumes, fragrance, essential oils. Oh, Taylor, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, this is super common because um, those, uh, basically think about this. If you have um, 
multiple chemical sensitivity, meaning you're extra reactive to uh, chemicals and you go down the fragrance aisle in Target and you get all um, sensitized. That means that your bucket, your toxic ability to detoxify is full. So we're all born with the bucket capacity to detoxify, meaning that's our ability to get rid of toxins and things. And as that bucket fills up over time, uh, it could be with mold, it could be with environmental toxic chemicals, it could be with um, natural gas in your house or a leak or radon or uh, heavy metals, you get mercury fillings in your mouth. And as that bucket starts to fill up, um, it overloads. And when it starts to flow over the top, you present with symptoms. And people with multiple chemical sensitivity will almost always have a very uh, full bucket. So um, what to do? First of all, avoidance is key when you can. So you really do want to decrease exposures to perfumes commercially. I use almost exclusively essential oils if I want to scent because I don't, that, or the perfumes if you do want to use them, which a multiple chemical sensitive person probably wouldn't. But for those of us who do want to use something like that, spray it on your clothing, not your skin, because it does absorb. And then you're going to get phthalates and parabens in your body. And that's not good either because those can contribute to cancer. If you, Leslie asked, if you have antibodies to COVID, do you need the vaccine? Uh, well, technically antibodies are what the vaccine gives you. So I would say no. However, um, I think the rules and regulations around how our country is going to be um, doing this is to be determined yet. So that question may, may um, the answer may come. Although technically, if you have antibodies, you have antibodies, however you get them. Uh, Cynthia, hi, and thank you for the live Q&A. 51, been on prednisone for two years and two months for mast cells due to mold toxicity, now off prednisone, but need to deal with osteoporosis. Oh, you poor thing. So she's taking um, some bone support, testosterone, doing exercises, estrogen, et cetera. Um, my concern is my non-MD approach, um, taking enough, is this enough to build the bone? So yeah, prednisone will decrease uh, or increase the reabsorption of bone. And so if you're on that long-term, that can be a risk factor for osteoporosis. So bone is a lot to do with acid alkaline. And how this works is if you're very acidic from infection or toxin or diet, or even um, airborne exposures, um, you're going to buffer that acid because the blood keeps the pH highly regulated. So that in order to regulate the blood pH, the body will borrow from the bone, those minerals, because they're alkaline and they will um, buffer that acidity in the blood. So first thing first, you wanna make sure you're alkaline in your diet and your detox. And how you can do that is lots of green foods, lots of leafy greens. Let me see if I can find my acid food chart. And if I can, I'll show you here. Um, quickly. Here we go. I think I can show you guys a picture of this on the screen share, just so you can see for one sec here. So these are acid alkaline foods. You can see in the most alkaline baking soda, sea salt, mineral water, and then broccoli, um, onion, sea vegetables, etc. And then more, more acidic would be like table salt, beer, yeast, sugar. So if you're in a very refined sugar diet, you're going to be a lot more um, acidic. And if you're eating more leafy greens and uh, nuts and seeds of some types, um, that's going to be a little bit more alkaline. So is this enough? Um, you know, it depends on your numbers and that. I, I think that like calcitonin nasal spray is a very gentle way to help increase bone density and it is prescription. And then I have mixed feelings about some of the other drugs as I'm sure you do. Um, but I would start there. I would monitor your bones and see how you do and think about acid and alkaline. That may help. Oh gosh, we're running out of time again. This is so much fun and I see tons of questions. Let's see if I can get a couple more in. We talked about Addison's. Um, Marcus uh, asked if tests positive by, by a blood test from gastro uh, for certain food allergies. Would you stay away from those foods? I don't react to those foods, but I don't want to cause further inflammation. And I always wonder if eating those foods um, could cause silent inflammation. Marcus, this is a great question because I have been to, so let me tell you my story. I had Crohn's disease at um, 26 years old. I'm completely in remission from Crohn's, but because of that, and because of the chemo I had from cancer, I have a very permeable gut and it's been healing all the way along. However, because of the permeability, I have developed IgE food sensitivities. If you would do a test on me, I light up like a Christmas tree. And so if I would, if I were to eliminate all the foods I'm sensitive to, I would probably not be able to eat many things. So what I do recommend Marcus is you take out the big ones, wheat, dairy, egg, soy, 
corn, maybe tomato, maybe potato, maybe a peanut, depending on you, maybe pine, some random things, get out the really large reactivities. And then for the rest, you want to rotate foods and try not to eat the same thing every day. Um, but if you have a severe permeability issue in your gut, you're going to have more IgG food sensitivities, and you don't necessarily want to forever eliminate all those. I like to have a diverse diet. So even if I have people eliminate them for 30 days or 60 days or 90 days, I'll often try to add them back in, in time. Oh my goodness, this is so much fun. So I do promise you all I will be back and I'm sure there's loads of questions I haven't gotten to, but I will um, take note on those and stay tuned because we'll do this again um, after the holidays and I will be back to answer your questions. Thank you so much for spending time with me today and I wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.